Hey everyone, it's me, Alex, and everyone's favourite bird, Archie. Archie is fresh out of the shower right now, that's why he looks a little bit like a drowned rat, but this little guy is always by my side, so he's just, he's just gonna sit here and enjoy himself. So, today's video is part two in my I don't even know how many part series mini documentary kind of thing that this is becoming. So if you haven't already watched part one, I really recommend that you go watch it. I have been contacted by a lot of the major, major news outlets about my video asking me for interviews and I haven't made any interviews yet because there is still more to this story and I don't really want to speak to anyone formally about it until I get everything that I want to say off my chest. Yesterday I discussed a little bit about uh, the fact that there are brands out there that are willing to pay influencers more to talk negatively about their competition. That is a very real thing. And I also talked a little bit about rates. For example, some influencers being paid $60,000 to talk about a product in a video. These are very real rates as well. Now, a lot of people were sounding off on Twitter, uh, some of the larger influencers saying things like, look, this is very rare. Like, yes, influencers get paid that much sometimes, but it's very rare. It's not very rare. Now, I'm not calling those people liars. I absolutely think they've probably just never heard of it. But people normally don't like to say how much money they're making because let's be honest, a lot of online YouTube personalities get paid so much money to not really do that much from the audience's point of view. A lot of people see a YouTuber sit down and talk about a lipstick, for example, and they say, how can that person make $60,000 just to talk about a lipstick? All they had to do was put the lipstick on. That didn't take any effort at all. They don't deserve that money. The thing I'm gonna to talk to you about today is where those figures come from. Sometimes the influencer or the YouTuber or whatever you wanna call them themselves will come up with the number. Sometimes their management will come up with the number. But as someone that works in marketing myself, I am gonna tell you a little bit about where that figure comes from, exactly how it's calculated, exactly the reasoning behind that, and I think you'll find it really, really eye-opening. I'm also going to talk about the fact that there's a lot of people that will purposefully gloss over negative elements of a product just to stay on the PR list. They will only say the good and they'll avoid speaking about the negatives just to stay on the PR list because there's a lot more to that than you might think. A lot of people think that they're doing that just because they want to stay on the PR list because they want the free products but there's actually a whole nother layer to that that a lot of people don't think about. And then I'm gonna talk about what legally needs to be disclosed in a video and what doesn't legally need to be disclosed in the video. And the ways that brands can get around saying that something is sponsored and the ways that they can really kind of manipulate the system. So that's what I'm talking about today. I will have other videos in the future as well. So if you found yesterday's video informative and you liked today's video as well, please consider subscribing. It shows your support for me and my honesty. So with that, let's get into it. Obviously we know brands will remove people from their PR lists. We hear about it all the time. We hear about people that have been receiving products from a company for years. They say one negative review and all of a sudden they're kicked off the PR list. Now the thing here is a lot of people online they get funny about PR and free things, and they say, you're only saying good things about that product because it was free. You didn't want to pay for that thing yourself. You're just on the PR list because you don't want to have to pay for it. But really, that's not it at all. When you think about it, think about a lot of these huge, huge YouTubers, and it doesn't matter what industry they're in, whether they're a beauty blogger, or they're fashion, or maybe they do DIYs, or maybe they do nail polish, or anything, it doesn't matter what industry they're representing on YouTube, this happens. So yesterday I was talking about the beauty community, but today I'm just talking about YouTube and advertising as a whole. Not even necessarily YouTube, just publishers on the internet. That's what I'm talking about. So don't go into this with a mindset of beauty. I often refer to beauty products because it's the first thing that comes to mind because it's the hot topic at the moment. But just think about this across all industries, what I'm about to say. So if you're on a PR list for something, I am going to use makeup as the example, but it could be for anything. If you are on the PR list, that means that you receive the products first. You will often receive them before they go on sale, before they're released to the public. Let's say there's a selected group of influencers for a brand that's launching a product. Maybe there might only be 10 of them. If you are one of those selected people, you're going to receive the product first for free. Now, a lot of these people that you're watching, these are people that if they wanted to buy it, if this was about getting stuff for free, they would just buy it, 100%. But that's not what it's about. 
It's about being the first person to receive the product. Because if you're on the PR list and you get that thing first, three weeks before it launches, and you're the first person to talk about it, or you're one of only 10 people to receive the product first, you're the one that's going to get the views. But let's take this into consideration. A beauty guru has been getting PR from a company for a year. They receive a product, they don't like the way it applies, all of a sudden, their PR gets cut off. That person, next time there's a product launch for that company, they don't get it. They don't get it first. They have to wait in line with everyone else and on the day that the product launches, they have to buy it with their own money. Now they don't care about that. They're loaded. They make a killing on ad revenue. They make a killing in sponsorships. The money isn't an element in this. They buy it, but the thing is the wait time. They wait a week maybe, or two weeks, depending on what country they're in. Maybe the product launched in America and they're in Australia and it takes two weeks for the product to be shipped to them. By the time the product arrives for that person to then make a video and talk about, that product has already been talked about by all of the big beauty influencers across YouTube or whatever vertical you're in, whatever industry you're representing, the people that are relevant have already spoken about it. Everyone has seen those videos before the product even launched. The hype was built up, you receive the product two weeks later along with everybody else, then you go to make a video about it and no one watches it because it pops up in their recommended and they go, oh, well, I mean, I, I already bought that thing or I've already seen everyone's review on that and they don't watch it. Now, what does that mean for the YouTuber? Someone that gets a million views, for example, you can kind of get a rough estimation of how much money they might make for ad revenue. And you can also kind of get an idea of how much they might make for a sponsorship. This information is actually really, really, really easily available, but people just don't know what to search for. So that's what I'm gonna tell you about. So we're gonna look at something called CPM. CPM means cost per thousand views. The M represents the Roman numeral for 1000, so CPM. A very, very good example to put this into perspective for you guys, because a lot of people were having an absolute fit saying, how can one person make that much money from a sponsorship? or if it's a just a regular video where they're making ad revenue, for example. How can someone make that much money? I had one comment here that says, all I'm saying is there is not one person on this entire planet who should be getting paid anything more than $10,000 to review an eyeshadow palette or a lipstick or clothes. No, no, no. It's not that deep. It does not take talent or skill to test an eyeshadow palette for 10 minutes and decide if you like it or not. These are simple tasks that us as normal people do every day. If anyone seriously values these beauty influencers' opinions that much and believes that beauty gurus deserve that much money to review stuff, I'm sorry, but you're probably 14 or you're just uneducated. Well, I'm sorry, but you're uneducated. Now, I'm not saying that that requires talent. It doesn't. I mean, look what, look at what I do. I unbox clothes and I try them on and I say whether I like the fabric or whether it fits well. It takes no talent whatsoever. But none of this is about talent. That is not what marketing or advertising is about. Advertising is about viewers. Advertising is about you guys. It's about the people that are going to see the product. It's about exposure. So to give you a good example, the Super Bowl. The Super Bowl gets 114 million views right? 114 million viewers worldwide tune into the Super Bowl. It costs 5 million US dollars for a 30 second ad segment in the Super Bowl. Just think about that, right? Now remember what I said about CPM, cost per thousand views. All you guys have to do is go on Google and type in CPM calculator. I'm going to bring one up right now. There's a couple of ways that you can determine how much someone might be getting paid, or if you're someone putting a price on your material, you can determine how much you deserve to be paid by looking at the CPM. So there's three factors that come into play. You can see them on the screen here. All you have to do is populate two of those factors. So using the Super Bowl as an example, what we're going to do is say number of impressions. Now, like I said, 114 million people watch the Super Bowl. Right? So that's the number of impressions. For the 114 million people watching, an impression is just someone is seeing it, right? The total cost for the campaign, I'm going to write $5 million. Because as we know, like I said, for an ad on the Super Bowl, it's $5 million. All I have to do is click calculate now, and it comes up with the CPM. So the cost per thousand views is $43.85 to decide how much someone will get paid for a sponsorship or whatever it may be. It could be a sponsorship or it could just, it could be a product placement or whatever. What we're gonna do, we're gonna take someone 
that gets a million views on every video, for example. So all we have to do here, the only factors that we have to change, the number of impressions, we're gonna change that to one million because this YouTuber gets a million views on every single one of their videos. That's a million impressions. We're going to leave the CPM as 4385 because we were just able to work out that CPM based on the Super Bowl. This is a hypothetical CPM. The CPM can vary depending on where it's being aired, what the, what the station is, what the channel is, what the industry is. Some industries set a higher CPM because they're more competitive, but we're just gonna leave it at $43. We're working on the Super Bowl kind of CPM. So for a million impressions with a cost per thousand views of $43, we're just gonna click calculate. $43,850. Does that make sense to you guys? If it doesn't, leave a question down below for me, but it's pretty straightforward. So let's take someone that gets, on average, every single one of their videos gets at least 3 million views. We know there's people out there that get that many views. There's a lot of them. Doesn't matter whether they're daily vloggers, they're fashion people, they're beauty people, they're DIY channels. We know every time that they post a video, they get about 3 million views. So for them to then determine how much they're going to charge for an ad placement or a sponsorship in their video, all they have to do is go into a calculator like this and say, number of impressions. Well, I know every single time that I post a video, I get 3 million views. They know that, it's a track record. So they'll put 3 million. Let's leave the CPM as 43. We're just using that as a CPM, just as like an industry, just a benchmark kind of CPM. Let's calculate. 131,550 dollars. So to put this into perspective, let's say, for example, what's a brand that, okay, when we all saw Shane's Jeffree Star series, I'm, I'm assuming we all saw it. When you think about Shane, now I am not saying Shane makes this sort of money, I'm not saying that. I'm just gonna use Shane as an example because most of us know who he is and most of us I mean, that Jeffree Star series has over 20 million views, right? Remember before Shane posted, he was tweeting about how we're waiting to find a sponsor. We're waiting to find a sponsor. Now, Shane got some fantastic sponsors on that series. He had betterhelp.com. Philip DeFranco is also sponsored by them. Like, this is a brand that has a fantastic message. It's counseling. It, you know, it's a service that's really, really easily accessible. Let's say betterhelp.com and Shane are trying to work out how much that betterhelp.com should be paying Shane to show that. Shane had no way of knowing that those videos were going to get 20 million views. He didn't know that. I mean, up until that point, his videos were getting what? Maybe like five, eight million views kind of thing. He didn't know it was going to blow up so huge. So let's just say Shane said to betterhelp.com, uh, we're probably gonna get about eight million views. So what betterhelp.com or what Shane could have done in that situation is gone number of impressions, eight million. Let's say the CPM, let's set a lower cost per thousand views. Now, the reason that I'm setting a lower cost for Shane Nothing against Shane, but when you work in marketing, you'll come to understand that different industries set different prices for their ads. For example, let's say someone makes a video about a makeup product and there's 20 makeup companies that have ads loaded on YouTube, ready to air. Who, whose ad gets seen? It's the company that pays the highest amount of money for their CPM. One company might say, look, our CPM is $20. We're only willing to pay $20 for a thousand views. Another company might say, we're willing to pay 30. Another company with a bigger budget might say, we're willing to pay 50. So when the ad is airing, for example, all of a sudden a bid, just like on eBay, the companies, it, they don't, there's no one actually physically sitting there doing it. It's all automated on the computer. Whoever has the highest price is going to get to show their ad first. That's the ad that will air. So for someone making videos about makeup, for example, to give you my exact experience, I posted a video that got 40,000 views and it was about makeup. It was 30 minutes long and I had three ads on the video. Another video I posted was 30 minutes long with three ads, but that video has 170,000 views. Those two videos made exactly the same amount of money, almost to the cent in ad revenue. And that's because the beauty industry sets a higher CPM than what fashion does. So I hope this is making sense. So bringing this back to Shane as my example. Shane, he's a male, he posts fun content, but when you think about it, he doesn't belong to any particular kind of industry. Unlike a beauty 
blogger, for example, who all they're doing is talking about makeup, right? So the ads that are going to play on their channel are probably going to be tailored towards people that like makeup. But for someone like Shane, who doesn't have a particular thing that they're discussing all the time, the ads that play on his channel might be a little bit more, you know, open, a bit more, they're not really tailored to his content, they're just kind of anyone that wants to play an ad to be seen by anyone. And those ads tend to go for a lower CPM. So let's say in Shane's case, his CPM, we'll bring it down from 43 was the example with the Super Bowl. Let's bring Shane's CPM down to 30, hypothetically. So Shane might have said to betterhelp.com, I'm going to get 8 million views on this video. I know that because that's my guaranteed video track record. I'll get 8 million views. Setting it at a CPM of $30, we'll calculate $240,000 for a sponsorship. Now, I'm not saying Shane made $240,000. I have no way whatsoever of knowing how much Shane made. He could have made $10,000 for all we know. But this is just from a marketing standpoint. This is how we in the industry determine how much we're willing to pay for a campaign or what we're going to price a campaign at. That is where that figure comes from. And these people out there saying no influencer deserves to make $60,000. Let me tell you how many views they would need to make to justify $60,000. Let's use a $30 CPM as my example. The company has approached them and they've said, we have a $30,000 budget or something. So we'll put $30,000 as the total cost of the campaign. The CPM is $30. Calculate, they would hope that for their $30,000 investment with a cost per thousand views of $30, they would get a million views. So can you see where these figures are coming from? Now, whether it's the influencer setting their price or whether it's their management setting their price, it doesn't matter who's setting the price. The price is being determined based on their track record and how many views they're getting. That's what it's determined by. It is not necessarily determined by subscribers. Someone could have 4 million subscribers and make less money than someone with 200,000 subscribers because maybe more people are watching their videos or maybe the person with 200,000 subscribers has content that advertisers are more willing to advertise on than the person with 4 million subscribers. To put this into perspective for you from a brand point of view, and the reason why some brands are willing to pay that sort of money, I'm gonna use this fantastic example that someone left on my video yesterday. And they said, if Makeup Geek pays $60,000 for a video and they're trying to sell an eyeshadow palette for $35, it would take around 1,700 of those 1 million viewers to make $60,000 in sales not including the price of production. And with that, maybe they might have to sell 5,000 eyeshadow palettes to make a profit. But still, when someone has a million views, if 1% of their audience goes ahead and buys that palette, the company can make a profit. So that's why these huge numbers do make sense to someone that comes from a marketing point of view. For someone that is a single mom that's working three jobs, just scraping by living on $40,000 a year, it doesn't make sense. It's unfathomable to think that someone makes that much money just from one video, and maybe they're making that three times a week. It, you can't even begin to comprehend that sort of money as someone that won't see that sort of money in three years of work, for example. When you're coming from a marketing perspective and you know how much advertising costs on television, we have this thing in the industry that we call advertising blindness ad blindness. We're all so blind to ads now. Imagine, I mean, most of us don't even watch television. We just watch Netflix and YouTube in my generation. But think about people that do still sit down to watch television. There's ads playing on free to air TV. The reason that the television can come to you for free is because there's ads. That's why people pay for television without ads. So you're watching free to air TV and an ad plays. What do people do? They'd probably pick up their phone and they, they mute the TV and they sit there on their phone until the ad break is over, they unmute it and they put down their phone and they watch it. Companies are paying huge, huge, huge amounts of money to air that content on the television because maybe a TV show has two million people watching the show every single night. Well, hey, Shane Dawson gets more views than that on YouTube. We are not talking about the content. We're not talking about the effort that went into the content. You could be a person live streaming picking your nose, but if you have 4 million people watching you picking your nose and an ad plays, you're gonna make the money for showing an ad to 4 million people. You could be doing anything. That's where the money comes from. It's got nothing to do with talent. So people saying YouTubers or beauty influencers don't deserve that money because what they're doing takes no talent. 
you need to change the mindset of the talent thing. It has nothing to do with talent in this industry. It has to do with the audience. Think of it this way. You might not like that someone is making $60,000 when they do a sponsored video. However, bear in mind, you're watching that video and you're watching them maybe because you enjoy their content, maybe you like them as a person. Would you rather see the money go to their pocket to help them pay their mortgage, help them raise a family? Do you want to see that money go to an individual who's going to use it for themselves? Maybe they're going to invest that money back into a business. I mean, look at Tati, for example. Tati has launched Halo Beauty. She's taken her money, she's invested it. Look at Jeffrey, he's made a makeup company. People do wise things with their money. Now, people that are disgusted that one person is making so much money, as long as products exist in this world, people are going to advertise them and people are going to make money. Do you want to see that money go directly into the pocket of a multi-billion dollar television station, multi-billion dollar company, that the money can go to them or it can go to an individual to pay off their mortgage, feed their family? It's like the supermarket thing. A lot of people in Australia right now are choosing to avoid Woolworths and Coles. There are big brand supermarkets. People are choosing to go to the individually owned privately, independently owned supermarkets because those people are selling locally grown produce and it costs a bit more. But that's the thing. People, do you want the money to go to an individual? An individual that owns their little grocery store on the side of the road and they work every single day, they work 70 hours a week to run their little grocery store and the money when you buy their groceries goes to feed their family? Or do you want that money to go to Woolworths? You just have to choose. You might not like the fact that there's influencers out there that earn that much money, but at the end of the day, as long as products exist, if those products are ever going to be sold or ever going to be seen by anyone, advertising is going to exist. Now, for a brand, it makes perfect sense to pay that sort of money, as long as the influencer has integrity. Because sometimes brands will pay astronomical amounts of money to an influencer, let's say a $50,000 campaign, they pay the influencer $50,000, no one respects that influencer's point of view, no one buys the product, the brand loses money. So that's why integrity is so important in this industry. If people don't believe what you're saying, if you say, if you fabricate lies about a product to stay on the PR list, for example, and people buy it and they're unhappy with it and they say, you know what, I'm never gonna listen to that person's opinion again. They said this thing was good, I got it, it was bad. They only said that because they wanted to stay on the PR list. This goes back to what I was saying earlier. Maybe they might gloss over the negatives and only talk about the positives because they don't wanna get kicked off the PR list. Because if they get kicked off the PR list, they're not gonna be the first person to upload content. They're going to be irrelevant. I mean, me for example, I'm not on a single PR list at all. I don't have really any sponsorships lined up. I have a sponsorship with Swarovski. I'm wearing a beautiful ring that Swarovski sent me. They sent me this ring to take a photo of it, to post on my Instagram account, and then they wanted me to send it back. They were gonna pay me to post the picture on my Instagram account. And I said to them, would it be okay if I kept the ring? Like, I think this is an absolutely stunning, beautiful, fabulous, gorgeous ring. Would it be okay if I kept it? Like, I mean, if I'm, I'm posting about it on my account, I actually do genuinely love this ring. And if they'd said no to me, Daniel was gonna buy this for my birthday. It's my birthday in a couple of weeks. And Dan, we wrote down the name of this ring and he was gonna buy it because I love it. But they came back to me and they were like, yeah, sure, you can keep it, that's fine. Like, it'll go to a loving home, you can keep it. So the thing is, people like to say that I beg brands for products. They say, oh, that pretty pastel, please. She's so stingy. She begs brands to send her things. But at the end of the day, if you're someone like me, for example, I'll ask because as someone that's trying to dish out a lot of content, imagine if I was paying out of my pocket every single time I was making a video, <laughs> I would have no money whatsoever at all. Because I mean, look at my whole video. Some of them are huge. Most of that I've paid for with my own money, but sometimes I get things for free. I've done a couple of makeup videos for a company called Yes Style, and they really respect me and they respect my opinions. And a couple of times in my videos, I've said, this thing is not worth your money, but this one is. And Yes Style didn't kick me off their list. They didn't do anything like that. I said a couple of things I didn't like, but there are also things I did like. They were like, cool, and they're still happy to keep working with me. Now, it's that coming from brands that allows influencers to remain honest. Influencers should be honest no matter what, whether or not they get kicked off the PR list or not. But the responsibility doesn't only lie with the influencer. It's not exclusively up to the influencer. It's also up to the brand to take criticism. If you don't like a brand's eyeliner and then the brand never sends you another product ever again, 
then you don't get to be the first person to review that product. You miss out on your 2 million views because by the time you finally receive the product, those views have all gone to everyone else that received the product. Your video is irrelevant. You don't make the same sort of advertising revenue on that. So it's like a big cycle. If brands can accept when negative criticism comes around, it means that influencers will remain honest. And if the audience can stop having a dig at people, the amount of comments I get saying, I don't believe anything you're saying in this video because you got this stuff for free. If you can tell that the person is being honest and they have integrity and you've seen them say negative things in the past, just because they're saying something positive doesn't mean that they're lying. I mean, the makeup that I've reviewed recently, I thought it, most of it was great. So I said it was great. I wasn't gonna make up something wrong with it purely to sound as though I was being more critical. But if I did see something wrong with it, I would absolutely say so. And for people to come along and say, you're only saying something good because you got that for free, it's that sort of attitude that then leads people to hide the fact that they got something for free. So now I'm just going to quickly talk about disclosure laws in Australia. So the Australian Association of National Advertisers, basically they have recently released guidelines. So there's three things about disclosure. The first thing is if a product is being paid to be shown on someone's account, if money is exchanged, or there's terms of any sort, whether or not money was exchanged or not, if there's terms to that agreement, it has to be disclosed as an ad. Legally, it must be disclosed as an ad. However, if a brand comes to an influencer and says, we wanna pay you $1,000 to take pictures of our products, and then we're going to post those pictures on our own account, they don't have to disclose that that's an ad because the company might have an Instagram account, but it, it's an Instagram account for a company. So, the Australian Advertising Board, they basically deem that to be, well, I mean, the Instagram account for that company is just one giant marketing technique or one giant ad for that company. It doesn't need to be disclosed. Archie. Let's say Taco Bell, hypothetically. We know that Shane loves Taco Bell. So if this was in Australia, I don't know how these laws work internationally and I highly recommend that you look up disclosure laws in your own country. But in Australia, let's say Shane Dawson was in Australia and so was Taco Bell. Taco Bell could pay Shane to take a picture of himself sitting in Taco Bell eating a taco. Taco Bell could then post it on their Instagram account and say Shane Dawson enjoying a taco on Tuesday. They don't have to say ad, they don't have to say we paid Shane or anything like that because it's already deemed to be an ad because it is placed on the Taco Bell Instagram account. But if that was on Shane's Instagram account and Shane was paid to post that, he would have to say, hashtag ad, hashtag sponsored, this was endorsed, this was paid for, whatever. What about when something is free? Now, this is where a lot of people get very, very confused with disclosure. In Australia, at least, and like I said, look it up in your own country, but in Australia, if you receive something for free and there are no terms attached to that free item, you don't have to disclose it. You're not legally obliged to disclose it. So what I'm talking about is, if you are a YouTuber and your P.O. box is publicly available on your YouTube in your description, for example, and any company can go onto your channel and they can see your P.O. box, they can send you a product. They don't have to send a letter, they don't have to send anything. That influencer, that YouTuber, they receive the product, they open it, they're like, oh cool, and they make a video about it. They're not legally obliged to say these items were gifted to me by that product by that company. They're not legally obliged to say that because there were no terms attached. The item turned up out of the blue, no note, nothing. They don't have to say it was free. They don't have to say that they didn't pay for it. I don't know exactly how the laws work in terms of if they pretend that they paid for it. I don't know what the laws are around lying. There is no guidelines about that, but they don't have to say that they got it for free. But imagine then if that parcel turns up and they've had email correspondence with the brand. So let's say the brand reaches out to them and they say, hey there, we love your account. Can we send you our bracelet in exchange for a review? And they say yes. Then they legally have to disclose that they got that bracelet for free because there were terms attached to it. So because the company said, if we give you our bracelet, can you give us a review? That's, that's now an agreement. So they do have to disclose that. But if the bracelet just appears on their doorstep and they make a video about it, they don't have to disclose that the bracelet was for free. They could say, they don't even have to say anything. They could, they could just be like, look at this beautiful bracelet I got. I got, not I bought. Look at this bracelet I got. This is so nice. I love it. It's my favorite bracelet. 
they don't have to say that that bracelet was for free. That's why uh, sometimes people are hesitant to say they got something for free because there's people out there that will trash talk them and say, you're only saying something good because you got it for free. And it's that mentality that leads people to not talk about the fact that they got something for free because they're scared that if they say I got this thing for free, everyone's gonna tell me I'm only saying nice things about it because it was free. So there's a couple of uh, frames of mind that kind of need to shift a little bit here. Brands need to stop kicking people off their PR lists because they have a voice of their own and they have an opinion. That needs to stop. People online need to stop either accepting sponsorships purely to talk about something that they don't believe in. A brand might come to them and say, can you talk about our thing? The person might be like, that's a crappy thing. But if you pay me $10,000, I'll talk about it. People need to stop doing that. They need to stop selling the integrity. And then people need to stop being so harsh on people that do receive things for free. Think about it this way, if your favourite beauty influencer gets something for free and that person, you know they've got a couple of million subscribers, they probably have a lot of money, what have they got to gain by saying good things about that free thing? Like, what have they got to gain? If they get kicked off the PR list, well, if they get kicked off the PR list, they're not going to be the first person to review it anymore. But if they have a big audience, like Tati for example, who we know has been removed from PR lists in the past, people will purposefully wait until Tati receives the product. If she doesn't get it in PR and she gets it three weeks later, people will wait until she talks about it before they buy it. So if you have that sort of platform where even if you're releasing a video late and everyone else has talked about it, but people trust your opinion over everyone else, you're in a good situation. I just hope that this kind of helps you guys to understand where those prices are coming from, helps you to understand why people will often gloss over the negative points of something and only talk about the positives because they want to be the first person to review it. And you can change that mindset by supporting people even after the thing is a trend. If someone talks about something a month after it was a hot topic, after it was a hot trend, they might talk about it a month later. If you can show support for people like that that aren't on PR lists, they might not be trendy because they didn't get the thing first. Brands need to respect the fact that they can't just kick someone off their PR list because they have an idea of their own. They, they really need to stop doing that. At the end of the day, my advice about this, what I've spoken about today, is if you see something online, whether it's a sponsorship, maybe it's a paid post, maybe it's an endorsement of some sort, or maybe it just looks like an endorsement, but it's not disclosed, just have a little bit of initiative and do a little bit of research. A, a quick Google search does not hurt at all. If your favorite influencer holds up some sugar bear vitamins, and says, my hair is really, really long because of these sugar bear vitamins. And you think, whoa, she's got long hair. She says it's because of the sugar bear vitamins. I'm gonna buy the sugar bear vitamins. Just before you buy it, just go on Google and type in sugar bear vitamins. Reviews are gonna come up. And if there's 10,000 reviews saying, I took these for a year and my hair didn't grow, you've just informed yourself that perhaps that person was saying that their hair is long because of the vitamins, but it's not. But let's say the person talks about the thing in a, in a sponsored post, or maybe it just looks suspiciously sponsored. Google it, maybe there's 10,000 great raving reviews. You'd be like, yeah, okay, sure. My, my favorite influencer got paid to talk about that. It's a good thing. Sure, I'm gonna buy it. Just take that little tiny, extra little tiny bit of time out of your day, do a quick Google search, just double check your information. Maybe watch a couple of other reviews, maybe watch them from big channels and watch them from small channels. That's all it takes. I'm not saying that all influencers are dishonest. So many influencers are so, so honest. And I'm not saying that all big influencers make that sort of money. Plenty of influencers are coming out on Twitter right now saying, oh, that's very rare. Not many people make that sort of money. A lot of people do make that sort of money, but they're not willing to talk about that because it's almost embarrassing just how much money people can make on a single sponsorship. It does happen and it's very, very easy to calculate. Just jump on a CPM calculator, go on Social Blade, have a look at what the ad revenue rates are roughly saying. Never take that as gospel. I mean, you might type something into a CPM calculator and it might say that the person gets paid $200,000 for that many views or something. It's not always correct. But from an industry standpoint, that is how we calculate things. And that's why brands are willing to pay huge amounts of money to influencers. So if you liked this video and you found it interesting, don't forget to give it a thumbs up. In my next video, I'm gonna be spilling some serious tea. You will not look at the internet the same way again. So don't forget to keep an eye out for that video. And with that, thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Mwah.